Today we're going to be talking a little bit about Moses. And uh, before we get into the scripture today, we're going to be in Exodus 3, if you wanted to start turning there now. Uh, so, a little bit about me. Um, before I got involved in the church stuff, I, I was always raised in church. I've always been a part of it. My dad was a deacon. My mom was the piano player uh, for our church. They were Sunday school teachers, and they had multiple different roles that they they uh, played in our church growing up. But I never, I never really saw myself doing any of that. Um, even, even after going to Bible college, like I, I really had no idea. All right, so this does not help my nerves any. Um, so growing up, I, I was involved, my family was always involved in church. Um, I even went to Bible college. I have a degree from the, it's now called Welch College, but our denomination's Bible college. And uh, even after that, I still had no idea what, what you know, God had in, in mind for our lives, and things just kind of led into what we're doing. We were, um, we were, as, as, I, as I had finished college, uh, I finished in 2011, and Becca uh, finished in 2012. And as we were in the process of, of finishing college, we had been going to uh, a friend of ours, Church Cliff Donahoe, in uh, Antioch, Tennessee. And uh, he, he had felt he was a church planner and had been in Antioch for about 13 years, I think it was, something like that. It, it, it had been a while. And he was feeling God's call to go plan another church and he invited us to go along with him on that venture we had nothing else going on so we thought well that sounds good for us we'll we'll move to Tallahassee Florida and and help you start this church Um, and as things progressed there we I really got used to and really enjoyed you know helping setting up tear down all that stuff Uh, but Cliff was going to be moving on Uh, the church plant there ended up uh, the board decided to shut it down. It was too expensive for for everything that we were doing there, and it just wasn't growing. So we felt it was it was time to move on. And once again, we were kind of in a in a kind of in limbo. We didn't know what what we were going to do. And Cliff, our pastor and friend, he he encouraged me to go into what we call church planting. And I had no idea, you know, I, even to this day, I, like, I, I don't, it, it feels weird for me to be a part of what we do, to, to call myself the assistant pastor here at the Bridge Church, which still sounds weird coming out of my mouth. But Cliff Donahoe was part of what, he, he, he was part of what encouraged me to do that. But for, for a while, we're, uh, we're not sure, we're un, uh, insecure about it, and we had we were very hesitant to do it. It's my I especially. Uh, Becca's a little bit more, you know, in an outgoing kind of personality than I am. I, growing up, it, it, if if you'd have told me when I was a teenager, even through college, that I would be up doing what I'm doing right now, sharing the gospel, uh, preaching a message, talking in front of a crowd. Period. Uh, I would have laughed at you if you'd have told me I'd be doing that. I was always the shy kid. I was always very quiet, kind of withheld. I'm sure, I'm sure my parents might say say otherwise. But um, if I was getting up in front of a crowd, I, I was always always a uh, kind of afraid of that. But we're we're going to read a little bit from about Moses when he's getting his start, and he, I don't I don't think I made some of these excuses, but we're going to see how Moses really tried to get out of doing what God was calling him to do. And for a little context, uh, let's read Exodus chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And this will give you a little bit of a context kind of leading up to Moses making all these excuses before he finally gave in and did what God was calling him to do. 
So Exodus chapter 3, verse 1 says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't the bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, for the Lord warned, take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the, Lord, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of, of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, the Vittites and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. Now let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this text. We thank you for the example that Moses has set for us, Lord, and, and how we can learn from Moses with not just all the, the teachings and the laws and the things that he, um, present, you presented through him, but how we can see how his life it can be similar to ours. We pray, Lord, that you'll give me the words to speak and calm my nerves a little bit so that I can use those words to the better of your glory, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So there's several things that we, we can see from this. God is calling Moses to go do this massive thing. He wants... Moses to be the one to lead his people out of Egypt. And if you know anything about Moses, Moses was not a perfect guy. Even after he, he had been leading for a long time, he'd still get angry and frustrated. When you read the stories of the Israelites, you probably understand why. But he, even he was a man, but God was able to use him. So let's look at a couple of things that we can see from this passage that should have given Moses some confidence that I can do what God's calling me to do. So I want to reread Exodus 3, uh, starting in verse 6. Um, Moses should learn from this passage that he can do this because God gave him his word. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moses heard this, he covered his face. And he goes on to talk about how he's heard the, the, um, the oppression and he's heard the cries. In verse 8 it says, So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. And he describes the land. And he says, look, in verse 9, Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. In that little bit there, God told him who he was, which should have been enough for Moses to be like, okay, he is the God Almighty, and he told me it's my job to do this. But even though God gave him his word, he says, he says I came down to rescue them, but he had to, he had to use a man to do it, because as we hear later on in Exodus, that if, if a normal human would have looked at God, they, they, would be, they would be killed immediately. So God had to use a man to be able to go do the things that he was calling them to do. And ultimately it says, I am sending you to Pharaoh. Moses should have realized right there, it doesn't matter what I've done in the past, what may happen in the future. God is the one that's telling me to go, I need to go. He's the one that has ultimate power. He has ultimate authority. And no matter what happens, I know that that's probably the right thing to do because 
God said, I'm sending you. The other thing we can see in that verse is Moses was chosen. It's not just that, you know, anybody could have went, but God chose Moses specifically to go and do that. And I, I think part of that might have been because Moses had weaknesses. Moses didn't, he didn't want that. Some people would have wanted that, to be able to go before Pharaoh and perform all these miracles and signs and to be able to, to tell this leader, you're going to let my people go because my God said so. But others might have left out the my God part and, and just said, because I said so. That's the words I'm using. You're going to let them go. God probably knew that Moses had a little bit of humility in that he, would, he, would use, he, he wouldn't use his power to be able to do all these things. And God would get the glory out of it. So Moses was chosen. And we see here, uh, if you go down just a little bit, in verse 12, God is answering one of the excuses that we're going to dig into here in a minute. And he says, God answered, in verse 12, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship the God at this very mountain. God said he's going to be with Moses. And that should have given him some confidence. It wasn't that God was saying, hey, go over there, do these things. I'll be over here waiting for you to come to the mountain. He was going to go with Moses and tell Moses the words to say, give Moses confidence. He was going to be with Moses through everything that he was going to be doing. And through that, we can see, we, we should be able to see Moses is a lot like us. He, he, he's, he's human. He's, he's, he lacks confidence in certain ways. E even the most, um, most confident of people that we may know probably have a, a lack of confidence in some aspect, even if they like to hide it. My, mine isn't always speaking or getting out in front of people. So, but God can take a weakness and, and use it for his glory. And something that we can take from this is if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you, going, you accepting Christ, going before the cross and accepting Him as your Savior, you have kind of done what Moses did when he went before the burning bush. He, he stepped onto holy ground, and he put himself into a space. He could have avoided that bush. God got Moses' attention through something exciting. He saw something burning, and I'm guessing it wasn't a little shrub. It was probably something large. He got Moses' attention. Moses went over to check it out. And, and sometimes ministry is a lot like that burning bush. We see it from afar. We see others doing it, and it looks exciting. Sharing the gospel sounds exciting. But then when, when it's actually time to do it it, 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 it gets really hard sometimes. We don't always want to put ourselves out in a vulnerable way. Sometimes getting up in front of others and speaking and sharing the good news of Jesus involves putting yourself a little bit into a vulnerable position because sometimes you're sharing how you got there. And when we see, when we go over some of Moses' excuses, we're going to see what brought Moses to this um, place in the wilderness leading sheep because he didn't start that way. He, he was raised in the house of Pharaoh, but because of life's choices, he's now in the desert leading sheep. But God had made that, God used that situation for his purpose and his glory. And if you're a believer, God is calling you out for a purpose. Um, your role as a believer is not to warm the seat or to have that nice warm fuzzy feeling that you're going to heaven one day when you die. But there's a purpose for your life. And sometimes that purpose involves getting out in front of others or sharing the gospel. Sometimes it may just be to one person. Um, so God has a purpose for you, just like he had for Moses. But we have to accept that purpose. Once, once Moses realized that when he approached that burning bush that uh, he accepted a role that that he didn't necessarily want, then he starts to make excuses. So I want to I talk through a couple of these excuses because some of these may sound familiar to you because you may have made them in your own life 
when God, when you feel that tugging in your heart uh, to go into the ministry, whether it's the music side, the speaking side, or you know helping out in the back or the kids, or or even um, just being a part of a church and witnessing to your friends outside, you may know that you're supposed to do that because the Bible tells us that we're supposed to do that. But we find excuses to give God why we can't do that. So one of the things I want to point out is, um, and it's, it's not a, a verbalized excuse, but it's probably something Moses had in his mind. Um, if, you, if you look back a little bit at Exodus 12, or Exodus 2, verse 12, um, Moses was, he had come out of the palace and was visiting some of his, his Israelite, fellow Israelites, and um, he saw an Egyptian beating another Israelite, and he felt like he needed to defend that Israelite. But the way he did it wasn't the best way to do it. And it says, uh, Exodus 2, verse 12, it says, And looking in all directions, which if you've got to do that, <laughs> if you've got to stop and look around and see if anybody's looking before you do something, you probably shouldn't do whatever it is we're about to do. Um, but after he made sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. And he thought he got away with this. He thought nobody noticed. Uh, I don't know if he did that in front of the Israelite that was, he was, that was being beaten. But people had seen him do that. And now he's a murderer. He, yeah, it might have, might have been, he might have had good intentions when he did it. But he killed an Egyptian because he thought he was the executioner and the defender of that person. But it wasn't his place to do that. So now, one thing that's probably running through Moses' head when he's doing this is, I've killed people. I killed a guy, and, and I, I shouldn't have done that. So an excuse he's probably making to himself, what, what leading to of the verbal excuses that he's given, is he feels insecure because he's done wrong things in his past. And, and you know... You may be in a position like that. I'm 99% I'm sure no one here has killed anybody. But you may have, um, Jesus said, if you hate, have, hold hatred in your heart, that's the same as, as committing murder or lust in your heart or you know, occasionally you tell a white lie or you've done some things that the devil is using in your mind to tell you you're not good enough to go do these things that God is telling you to do. And we've got to realize that, as we see with Moses, God takes imperfect people who do imperfect things, and he uses them for his glory. So I want, let's look at another one of his excuses in verse 3. This, in this one, he's, he actually verbalizes. And in verse 11, Moses, it says, But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? You hear in the way he's phrasing this, he does not feel confident in his ability to lead others. And he may, you know, he's leading a flock of sheep, so he may have other people that he's working with, you know. But working with a couple people or working with a handful of sheep is a little different than leading, some estimates, two, three million people out of a country where they are currently slaves, and, and, you know, he's one of them. So he, he's got this lack of confidence in his ability to do this. So he's, you know, the, the New Living Translation uses the word protest. He's trying his best to get out of this, and, Moses was, or, and God wasn't having it. And, and, and in verse 12, it says, God answered him. And one thing you're going to find with all these excuses God has an answer. He's, he's going to, if he wants you to do something, he has an answer for every, he already knows what you're going to throw out at him. He already knows your excuses. He already knows what, what you're getting ready to say to him. So he's already got an answer for you. And when, when he questions, who am I? God says, I will be with you. When, when, if you're a believer, the moment you began to believe in Christ Jesus as your Savior and that there's a living God that loves you and sent Jesus down here for you, 
God is now with you. Uh, a lot of people like to say, well, everyone's God's children. God's children are those that believe him and accept him. Just because you're God's creation does not mean you're his children. We have to, we have to come into God's family before we can say that we're one of his children. And God is not always going to be with us if he's trying to get you to believe. He, he's going to be putting things in front of you. So in, way, in a way, he is with you. But until you become a believer, he's not in you and with you and around you all the time. Once you've become a believer, God is with you. And he has that promise, not just to the people of Israel, not just to Moses, but he's given that promise to us. We see that several times in the New Testament. So the, the next excuse that Moses offers is, he says, if I go to them, um, if I go to the people, in verse 13, Moses protested again, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name and what should I tell him? And this sounds like a, a, an honest question. And in a way it is, but he's, he's just one more thing. trying. To, well, I don't know who to tell him. I don't know who to tell him that, that sent me. But once again, God replies to Moses in verse 14. It says, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. One of the things you will find throughout Scripture is one of the names of God is I am. Not I could be, would, not sometimes, like he is. He always has been. He always was. And that's kind of what's conveyed there. Like, he is who he is. And he does not change. It says, I am sent you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. So he not only tells him, one of his names is I am, but I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which implies that he's a living God, because, and, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are in heaven with him because he wouldn't be the God of a dead person. He's the God of someone who's alive. And they know, the Israelites know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're all founding fathers of the Israelite nation. And that should be... That should be a confidence to Moses that God is still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's still the God of the people of Israel, and he's still the God of Moses and the God of anyone who believes in him. But Moses is trying to get out of this. And he, he, he continues to try to protest. So... Down in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1. And, and leading after that, God goes through an explanation of, of why using his name should help others to believe. But then in, in chapter 4, verse 1, we see Moses protesting again. And he says, what if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord never appeared to you? Now, the things we're getting ready to see next... Are, are amazing, and when when if you accept the call to to go in God's will and do the things He's calling you to do, He may not do these do things quite as miraculous as, as the the things that follow these verses. Um, we see God command Moses to throw. He, he has a staff in his hand, and He commands Moses to throw it on the ground, and it the stick turns into a snake which scares Moses. But then he, God tells Moses to, to grab the thing by the tail, which is, if you've ever picked up snakes, which I don't know how many people do, but I, sometimes I do. Um, if you ever try to pick up a snake and you pick it up by the tail, you're going to get bit. But God told Moses to pick it up by the tail, and as soon as he does, which I... You know, I know Ty Tyler doesn't like snakes, so I don't know how he would have done this. But Moses reaches down and grabs the thing by the tail, and instantly it turns back into a staff, which would be amazing to see. 
Now, I'm sure when we, I've not, I've not experienced anything like this. I, I feel like, you know, I've been doing what God's called me to do, but I've never turned a stick into a snake and then picked it up by the tail. So hopefully, um, those of you that don't like snakes, uh, you don't have to deal with that. Um, but we also see Moses, or, uh, the Lord told Moses to put his hand inside of his coat, which it sounds kind of weird, but when he does it and pulls it out again, it's covered in a, in a skin disease, which probably, that would, uh, it frust- I, I, I have allergies on my skin, and, and um, when I break out in things, it's so frustrating because you, you just nothing, you just have to wait for it to heal. But to, to instantly put your hand in your shirt, pull it out, and see that, like that had to be amazing to Moses. And then God tells him to put his hand back in his shirt, and when he pulls it out, it's clean. It, it, the rash is gone. So God provided these signs <clears throat> to show that, hey, quit making excuses. Like, this is, what I can, this is what I can do. I can make a stick turn into a snake and then back again. I can make your skin leprous, uh, covered in a rash, and then I can make it instantly healed again. But still, Moses is making excuses. Um, and, and I don't know... You know, most of us will probably never do anything quite this miraculous, but there may be things that God puts in your way. Um, you know he's calling you to do something, and you're making excuses, and then things just, weird things happen that this lines up, this lines up, this lines up, that shouldn't, these things shouldn't have worked out. But all these things start coming together that lead you to what God's calling you. It, it may not seem as miraculous as snake and, and turning a stick into a snake and, and leprosy on your hand instantly, but things start to work out, and you're like, this, this has to, I know this is God's working this out. Uh, when we, when every time we've moved, we've lived, uh, we've helped start church plants in Virginia, Florida, and now Illinois. Every time when we commit and moved, things fell into line for us. Those may not be as miraculous on the surface as the snake or the, the rash on his hand. But when, when you're doing what God wants you to do, things just work out. Um, one of our moves was, it was near, near the beginning of the school year, and with Becca being a teacher, it's hard to get in. When we moved to Florida, she was able to get into a school pretty quickly. We found a house pretty quickly. I, I found a job pretty quickly. Um, things just fell in line just in, just in time. It wasn't like it was, you know, we were strapped. It was hard. You know, Becca found a job when, we, when, we got, when she first moved to Florida. When I, excuse me, when I moved to Florida, I, I found a job right away. We found a house that worked. Um, just when we moved to Virginia, she got a job right away. Um, the house worked out. We found a really nice place to live. When we moved here to, Virginia, uh, for, to Illinois, um, things just worked out. And it might not sound like that's miraculous, but when you move to a completely new, new place and you don't know anybody, especially teaching, it's not always the easiest to get into a job um, or the housing here. Um, we just happen to find the house that we're in now. Um, and I have no idea how we're still paying what we're paying. Like things, it, it worked out that we got the house that we wanted next to the big field where we can host events. Like, things just fell into place for us when we were doing what we felt like God was calling us to do, even though, even to this day, I'm not the most confident um, in my abilities. Um, it just, I, I'm, sometimes I, I just feel insecure about the things that we're doing, and I don't feel adequate. Getting up here in front of you guys and, and to be able to try to pull uh, information from the scripture and, and convey it to you. I don't always feel the most confident with it. And while I didn't necessarily make all these excuses, I probably had it in my head. But um, God made a way for us to do the things that he willed for us to do. And it, it worked out. Um, the, the other thing that we can see in verse 1 is... He, he kind of has a, a, a lack of confidence in his ability to speak. 
Uh, well, that's the next, um, in verse 10, sorry. Um, the, 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 the last, the, one of the last excuses. Now, there's two more excuses, this one and one more. And it, uh, Moses, in verse 10 of chapter 4, it says, Moses pleaded with the Lord, O Lord, I am not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. I don't know if you all have ever gotten up in front of a crowd, but um, I feel like I've gotten a little bit better. But you sh- there's, there's times you're reading, you might have all the words in front of you, and you still stumble over your words sometimes. And some of that is a lack of confidence, but some of that, you know, you might have a stutter or, or, or something else going on. Or um, I, I've had several friends that English isn't their primary language, so getting, if they're speaking in English... Uh, we even have a missionary up near Chicago. Um, he some, he'll tell you he sometimes has a little trouble finding the words that he wants to say in the language that he's trying to convey it in. So, you, you know, might have a, a language issue or a stutter or something else or just a lack of confidence in your ability to speak. But as we saw previously, God will prepare you for things like that. Um, part, of, part of what I think has prepared me to be able to get up and speak. Um, when I started doing church planting, I had to go and speak. And I had to do it over and over in front of other churches while I raised money and raised support for um, us to be able to move and do the things that we do. I had to practice it. And just because you're not good at something now, it's kind of like playing an instrument, speaking, uh, even drawing, working on a vehicle or woodwork. you gotta, you got to do... You got to do whatever it is that you're trying to get better at. If you just want to play the guitar, like you can look at it all day long. You ain't gonna, you ain't gonna learn nothing. You've got to actually pick the thing up. Maybe find someone who can give you lessons. Um, find a way to practice doing that and learn how to do those things. So Moses is trying to use this excuse that he's not good with words, but once again. God has an answer for him. And it says, The Lord asked Moses, in verse 11, Who makes a person's mouth? And I, I, can, I can hear God right now. He's probably not asking this in a, in a hey, who, who makes the mouth? He's probably like, Moses, come on. Who made your mouth? Like, who do you think made you? Who, who gives you the words? Who made your tongue able to weirdly make vocal like words and, and sounds and things that someone else can understand. Who did that? Who can decide, he goes on, who decides whether people speak or don't speak, hear or don't hear, see or don't see, because God can, God can take those away or give those. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I hear him getting angry. Now go. I will be with you as you speak and will instruct you what to say. I, I, I just imagine there's, there's, there's a little bit of frustration in the Lord's voice. And, and I, can, I can imagine that, that bush just flaring up a little bit, the fire getting a little bigger like, Moses, come on. And then we see the final excuse that Moses offers. It says in verse 13, But Moses pleaded again, Lord, anyone else? <laughs> Anyone else? And, and the Lord's response, I think, is the ultimate, okay, I'm leaving. I'll go. I'll go. Then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said. What about your brother Moses, or brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way here now. And he will be delighted to see you. That's another one of those things. Moses did may not have known Aaron was on his or uh, uh, yeah Aaron was on his way. He may not have known that, and now God's like, shut your mouth and listen to me. Go look if you don't want to do it, you're still going to lead, but I'm going to use you through Aaron to go speak to Pharaoh, to speak to the people of Israel, to lead them out. So. Some, a way that we can apply that to us is sometimes we're able to use someone else. Um, you know, maybe a, a t- 
teacher's assistant or uh, may not be the best example, but the press secretary for the president. They, they have someone else that's able to go out and speak for them. So maybe uh, God is sending you and he's going to partner you with someone. One of the ways our denomination in the last probably decade or more has been doing church planting is they send out a team. And I, I, I don't think it's for this purpose, uh, for the one to lead while the other one does the speaking necessarily. But it works when you're in, in the ministry. It's hard when you're alone. Um, we used to send out a church planter by himself, just him and maybe him and his wife. And they would go into some unknown area and plant a church. And sometimes it, and, and it would always get really hard. Now we have started sending out by two. Sometimes the two will build a team and a team will, of, of more will go out and they'll have everyone that's able to do all the things. God will provide you with the tools and the people and the, the training to be able to go and do His will. So if you're feeling the call today, which I'm, I'm going to read here in a minute, a, a verse, and there's multiple verses in Scripture. If you're a believer in Christ and you have accepted Christ as your Savior, whether you know it or not and whether you like it or not, you've been given a calling because our purpose is not to sit in a pew, sit in a chair, sit on a bench, to, to sit and warm a seat. Our job is to go and train others to do the same thing. So I want to read a couple of, I want to read one, and this is one that I used a lot when we were on the road traveling um, to kind of help people understand why we do what we do and why, if you're a believer in Christ, why you should, it may not be going and planning a church, but it, it you're called to do something and not just to sit around and just be thankful you're not going to hell anymore. If you look in Matthew 28, and we'll, we have this up on the screen, uh, starting in verse 18, and this is, the, this is after Jesus has he's been resurrected. He's, he's shown himself. He hasn't yet ascended into heaven. He's still, still on earth here with his disciples. And it says in verse 18, Jesus came into the soul and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. If you're a believer in Christ, you are also a disciple of Christ. You're being taught by Christ. Anytime you come to church or go to a Bible study or read the scriptures on your own, you're discipling yourself in those ways. People are discipling you. You are a disciple of Christ if you are a believer in Christ. And we are commanded to go, whether it's go to your neighbor, maybe even go to your children, or it's go across the world. You're called to do something for the Lord, for the work of the ministry. Whether you like it or not, you've accepted that. And you may not have been taught that before, but there's, there's other verses that explain that. But we, as believers, have been commanded to go and share with others. And we may not feel adequate, but we are called to teach others. So even if it's, uh, if you've raised kids, you're teaching. You have to teach. You're teaching children so you can teach others. You just have to find ways to convey the message. And it might be, you just have to practice. Uh, you might just stumble all over your words, but God is working at those people that you're speaking to. Um, you may not realize it, but if you felt called to talk to someone, God's probably already been at work in that person. So it might be weird, and they might even reject you at first. 
And it might be years after the fact, and you may not even know when they do it, but they may still come to Christ because you first planted the seed and you went to them and shared the good news of Jesus Christ. And if we do those things, ultimately, when we are in the will of the Lord, ultimately, we will be rewarded for that. It may not be in this life. It may be later on. But I want to read a couple of verses that kind of go through what God says He will do for us if we are in His will. And not all of it's pleasant. The first verse I want to reference here is 2 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 13. And it says, This is a trustworthy saying. If we die with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure hardship, we will reign with Him. If we deny Him, He will deny us. And if we are unfaithful, He still re- he remains faithful, for He cannot deny who He is. And it goes on to say, remind everyone about these things. So the, the Christian life isn't always going to be hard, because people have been martyred for the, for the, the, um, for the gospel. Life may be hard. But he's going to be with us. And that's part of the reward, is he's going to be with us. I want to read from Romans 8, verse 17. And it says, And since we are his children, we are his heirs. And if you know what an heir is, that means you're inheriting something. We are heirs of, of God's glory. But... If we are to share in His glory, we must also share in His suffering. Life's not going to be easy being a believer, being a follower of Christ. But we're an heir. We will inherit what God has for us. Heaven, eternity with Him. Just riches unknown. If we do what He's calling us to do, we will inherit all those things. A little bit lighter one. It's not all about pain and suffering. I think I wrote down the wrong verse. Yep. Uh, What was the next scripture I put up there? I I think I had it in there. I think I put up the wrong scripture in my my Bible. All right, uh, so Matthew chapter 10. This one should be the right verse. Um, if you give a cup of cold, even if you give 1042, stumbling over my words here, and if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you surely will be rewarded. So basically what that's saying is no matter how little your calling is, you're going to get a reward. You, you will be rewarded for doing that thing. As simple as sharing a drink of water with someone You're doing that. If you do that in his name, you will be rewarded for that. Another verse that kind of goes along with this reward is Colossians 3, verse 24. It says, Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Remember why you're doing the things that you're doing. Uh, sitting back in the sound booth and working on the things that I do and the slides and things, it can be easy to forget why I'm doing those things. I'm doing that so that you guys can have a better worship service or to, can a better understanding. Or and and, and Jesse and, and Phil both are part of doing the things that are behind the scenes. If we can do things to make your worship, your Bible reading better, uh, we're doing that in the service of Christ. And I want to read one final verse that goes along with our reward. And it's from Revelation 21. And it says, And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among His people. He will live with them and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. He will wipe away 
every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for I tell you what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To those who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. If we're in God's will, um, and, and, and we get past, like Moses, all the mistakes, all, all, the, all the excuses and things that he offered, that we have to offer, and we listen to God's answers to those, and then we go and do the things he is calling us to do, ultimately, we will be rewarded with a home in heaven, eternal life, no death, no sickness, sorrow, or pain, in a land where we will live forever in the glory of the Lord, the one who created us, died for us, and, and is living again. We have all of that to look forward to. And it's not a heaven of sitting on a cloud with a harp. We'll, we'll get to do things that, that glorify God as the way the earth was originally designed, through work that we enjoy, through hanging out with friends, through meals, through serving Christ, and, and through worshiping the Lord. Like, heaven is a wonderful place. And if you, if you ever get a time to do a study on heaven and the things that we will inherit, there, uh, I've, I, while I was deployed to Kuwait, I read an entire book on it and did a, a lot of reading on it. Heaven is a wonderful place that we have to look forward to but we have to work here on earth to help bring others there with us, there, so that we can inherit all of that. Because we don't want to do it alone. It, you don't want to be alone in heaven. We want to have multitudes of friends and family and all the people that we love and care for. We want them to be there with us in eternity, enjoying the creation that God has for us. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know what your calling may be on your life today. But if God has called you to do something, if you're a believer, he has called you. You may just not know what it is yet. Whatever it is God's calling you to do, he's going to be there for you. He's going to cut through all the noise, and he's going to make things work for you to be able to do the things that he wants you to do. Whatever it is you're called to do, find that thing. Pray, read the scriptures, and go and do it. Because like serving the church here, I enjoy this. It's not always easy, especially when I have to get up in front of y'all. But I enjoy doing it. Even when it's kind of hard, it's enjoyable. Find that thing God's calling you to do and go and do it. Go and do whatever that thing is. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the example Moses has for us. We thank you for being able to cut through his excuses and cut through the noise, Lord, and to be able to provide him the confidence and the ability to go and ultimately lead your people through the desert, out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, doing amazing things. And ultimately, he led them all the way up to the Jordan River where they were able to then cross over into your promised land. Help us, Lord, to be an example and a light for you in this community. Help us to find the will that you have for us so that we can go and do those things for you so that ultimately we can grow your kingdom and to be able to enjoy our inheritance in heaven, Lord, with you. And Lord, just, just go with us and give us that strength to serve you this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.